Um, and, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, one of the perks of COVID is having these virtual events and being able to invite um, members of our community that we don't often get to see in our co-working space here at VSET. Um, so thanks for joining. Um, I just give a little intro to um, Sophie here, who has been a VSET member for about three years now, I say. Um, and she's the founder of All of the Milo Social, um, which is a digital marketing agency that focuses on social media consulting, strategy, management, and measurement um, for really businesses of, of a bunch of different sizes. Um, we've seen her grow her team here and her business skyrocket, um, and it's just such a pleasure to work with. She actually did VSET Social as well. Um, and then for anyone who doesn't know what VSET is, we're Vermont Center for Emerging Technologies. We're a nonprofit that serves uh, all of Vermont's entrepreneurs through co-working space, mentorship, coaching, um, events, access to our community, investment, so many things. Um, and I'll, I'll throw some links in the chat if you want to check her out, check us out. Um, moderating the, the questions today will be Sam Roach Gerber, who's our vice president. Um, and then also this Lunch and Learn is sponsored by um, the Vermont Small Business Development Center, um, which are expert advisors providing guidance to Vermont small businesses, um, and especially ones impacted through COVID-19. So you can learn more about them at vermontsbdc.org, and I'll put a link in the chat as well. Um, and they have the recovery roadmap and a host of resources for recovery, reinvention, and resilience, and are just awesome resources here in Vermont. Um, so I will let you take it away, Sophie and Sam. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, really excited to be here um, today and, and to get to ask Sophie a bunch of questions. Sophie's a good friend, but um, we rarely get to talk about her work, um, and she really is our, our sort of go-to expert at VSET whenever we have a social question um, or one of our clients has a social question, um, Sophie's our go-to. Um, so so there, what I'll do is um, I'll ask her some questions. The wall, if everyone could mute themselves, that would be great. <laughs> and I think we have some background noise going uh, on. Downstairs in the bathroom. Two by four. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to kick off. I'll, I'll ask some, some questions that, that Phoebe and I have been dying to ask Sophie that we think are relevant, that we've been hearing a lot of different companies um, sort of, you know, ask, inquire about topics that we've seen come up, um, especially since COVID. Um, but we'll start there and then we'll give you guys plenty of time to ask questions as well. So if you do have questions, feel free to add them in the chat as they come up. Um, and then Phoebe will go ahead and moderate those um, towards the end. Um, but just to get started, um, Sophie, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you personally got into social and, you know, at what point you realized this was the career that you wanted to, you know, jump into? Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I studied marketing and communications um, at Champlain College. And when I graduated about seven years ago, I had already started doing marketing for a company out West. Um, and I was kind of in a more of like a broader marketing position. Most of it was digital marketing, um, but social media marketing hadn't really become a thing yet. It was like right on the cusp of people, you know, Instagram had just started and, but people were really only using it personally. Um, it was still like, you know, the name Insta, like it was still people putting things up instantly. It wasn't really any planned content or business content. Um, and so when I was working for them, they kind of put me on the social experiment of, you know, like, hey, I think that we should start using Instagram for, um, we're already kind of using Facebook for, for marketing, but they really want to branch out and start using Instagram, realizing that that was kind of like the new hot trendy platform. Um, and so they put me on a social experiment to kind of, they're like, you know, go figure it out, see what it's all about before you start doing it for us. Um, and so I started playing with a few accounts. Um, we have a pet mini pig, so used her as a social experiment and didn't tell anybody about it and just put her account out there just because I didn't want to put myself out there. So it was like, you know, I'll start this account. It will be unknown. It'll be in the background, but it will give me a way to kind of just learn the ins and outs of the platform and what it's like to deal with an audience and put content out there. 
Um, and so I was able to kind of, it took off, which was unexpected, but it was really cool because I was able to see what it was like to deal with a big audience and um, strategize how to please this audience, but also get messages across. And I was able to take that back to the company that I was with at the time. Um, but that kind of transitioned to me helping a lot of other people with their social media. Um, and I quickly realized that I really liked helping lots of different individuals and companies versus just one. Um, and it also kind of helped me see that social media was where I wanted to be versus, you know, marketing is a really big picture of whether it's email or website design or SEO and they all kind of talk to each other and they need to talk to each other. But this is how I realized that I wanted to stick with social mainly. I mean, what better way to take advantage of having a pet mini pig, right? That's <laughs> awesome. Um, and I love that you had that sort of like experiential approach to it. I think it shows in your work. And I think that's really, for me, at least the biggest barrier to my social media success has been just like the patience to get on there and try things and, you know, put in the work and um, it makes sense that that's sort of how you got started and, and got passionate about it. Um, what do you love about social media? I mean, I, I get so frustrated because I feel like it moves so quickly. I feel like as soon as I learn something, it's already like, oh, actually that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. Um, so is that part of what you like about it? Or tell us a little bit about what part of it is really makes you passionate. I think, I mean, two things. I really, I weirdly do like how fast it moves, which is interesting because I'm not a huge fan of change or fast paced environments in other ways. Um, but I think like the fast paced change in technology is what really interests me because there's just always more to learn and always more to kind of change. Um, and, and I think what I also really like about it is social media is kind of like the intersection of being able to be really creative, but also um, it's all driven by analytics and numbers. Um, so it gives me the opportunity to like, you know, I originally went to school for photography and art and journalism um, and then didn't really think I could make a career out of it. So that's when I switched, you know, more to broader communications and marketing. But um, art and design and photography has always been a passion of mine. And I think social media can be the tool where you tell that story, but it's also just all backed up by numbers and strategy and data. So it's kind of the best of both sides of my brain for me. Yeah, that's so cool. Sorry. Um, and then, so I think, um, so now you're working as, as uh, under your, your company, Olive and Milo, and you have tons and tons of different clients, individuals, businesses, um, small and large. What is, when you look at your day to day and your team and the work that you do, what's the hardest part of it? What is it that keeps you up at night? Um, Good question. I think it depends. Sometimes it's content. Sometimes it's creating the content and kind of pulling content together because I mean, content is so important. You don't really have social media if you don't have content, but content doesn't come easily. For some clients, content is the bulk of what they do. So it's really easy for us to pull. Um, other times, content is a harder investment for folks, whether it's, you know, photography or just like any sort of creative asset or, um, you know, maybe there's a lot going on in the company, but it doesn't really translate well to social media because it's not visual or, you know, there's not much that you can share with the public, um, depending upon, you know, if they're um, a doctor's office or an insurance agency or something, um, it's a little bit harder to put out there. Um, so sometimes it's a real challenge to kind of not only access that content, but um, help clients understand that, you know, investing in it and really pulling it out really helps us succeed and help them succeed. Um, I think so. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say the other thing is just the platforms themselves um, can be a really, it's, it's out of our control, but it's also what the entire business is based off of. So that is a struggle for sure. Yeah, the, you're, you don't have no way of controlling what Facebook decides to change right. at a moment's notice. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, you touched on something that I thought was really interesting. And I, I feel like I personally, the organizations I've worked with, I've, there's always been a really strong visual element, um, which is helpful. But do you have any advice for companies that don't have that really strong visual element? Like where can they go for content that is valuable and useful and, you know, nice to look at as well on social media? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, in any case, but especially for these folks, creating their own original content is key. And that's really hard because they're busy doing what the company does. They don't really have time to actually create the content, whether it's, you know, content pages on their website or writing blogs or, um, you know, putting together videos or these types of webinars or things that they can share with the public. Um, but that kind of original content, especially if you don't have like a photography element or a lot of it is kind of done on the computer. So you can't really take pictures of what you're doing to share it and tell the story. Um, there's also a lot of incredible sources of just like, you know, following feeds, like um, Feedly is a good one where you're pretty much plugging in keywords and you're creating your own feed of just um, third party, you know, articles and webinars and um, ones that kind of relate to back to the company. Um, and I think like the strategy there is just thinking about where you want to show up. Like if you're not a very visual company, then thinking about the platforms you want to be on. Um, cause not, I think there's an urgency to show up on every single platform, but if you're not super visual, then maybe Instagram isn't the best. Cause then you're just kind of pulling not such visually pleasing content and putting it on a platform that's meant for, um, you know, more visual content. Right. That's a really good point. I think there is a lot of pressure to be on as many channels as possible, regardless of whether they're actually effective for you. So I think that's something that's really good to keep in mind and um, that it's okay to maybe say no to the ones that, that don't seem that they align with you. Um, yeah. Do you have a sort of hard and fast rule around the percentage of content you should share that's original versus sharing things that, you know, like-minded companies or influencers have shared? Is there some sort of like right breakdown of that? I don't think there's really a magic number, especially because it's so different for everybody. I think that original content should always kind of be the bulk of what you share. Um, but it's also so situational where that's not always the case. And I also think that um, showing a case, you know, showing sometimes non-original content is good because it shows thought leadership and it shows, um, you know, if you're sharing this resource, it shows that you can you're someone who's, you know, in that space and you're sharing this because you're aware of kind of what's out there. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then something we had just talked about is, is, you know, having multiple platforms, whether you're on, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, all of those. Yeah. What advice do you have for brands or companies that want to make sure that they sort of unite their content across all the channels? I know, Phoebe and I definitely struggle with this um, at Visa where, you know, if we have a great Instagram post, it's very visual, we know exactly what we want to say, you know, how do we take that and put it on Facebook? Do we just, should we just use the, um, the automatic button that drags it over to Facebook or um, should we kind of, you know, not put it on Facebook at all or sort of change it slightly to be more Facebooky. Um, right. What do you, uh, you know, what do you suggest there? Um, never using the automatic button as much as <laughs> it's tempting. Uh -oh, I mean, it just looks, it, it depends because you can use the automatic button and then you can go back and you can edit it to make it, you know, you just want to be careful. Like all of your Instagram hashtags don't show up on Facebook when you use that button, because then uh, <laughs> I would never do that. I have no idea what you're talking about. Who are you? Um, <laughs> Cause they just don't serve the same purpose. And then it just kind of, um, I don't think people really care or pay much attention to it at the end of the day, but it looks a little, you know, it's kind of obvious that that's what's going on. Um, but I think that again, kind of back to what you're saying about thinking just what platforms are best and like kind of balancing the urgency and the pressure to be on every single platform every single day when really that kind of results in, spreading yourself too thin because and rather than you know just focusing on the platforms that serve maybe serve the company better but also serve that individual piece of content better um mm. and it's okay for certain things to be on one platform and not on the other platform um, especially depending on what it is um and then you can also think about like the audiences um you know most of us are on all platforms but there's also a lot of people who are on instagram especially younger demographics, they're on Instagram, but they're not on Facebook, or, you know, a lot of people aren't really using Twitter personally these days. Um, so kind of keeping those few things in mind when you're deciding um, what goes out to, you know, all platforms, if everything goes out to all platforms. 
Okay. And then that that's really helpful to know. And I think, you know, another thing I know I'm, I'm using VSAT's problems, but I'm assuming that others, other folks have, have similar challenges. Um, you know, I think about as a, as a sort of a case study for you. So like, um, you know, we might have an event that we're trying to promote, let's say a lunch and learn with Sophie Robbie. Um, and, you know, we do sort of a social media blast where we put it on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and so I'm hearing obviously that we should sort of craft each individual post to be specific to that channel, not use the automatic uh, button. Um, do you think there's a timing aspect there? If you're posting about the same sort of event or, um, you know, blog post or press release, um, do you want that to sort of all go out at the same time? Or is there a strategy behind, um, you know, Instagram first, let it, you know, get on people's feeds and then Facebook two hours later, is there some sort of like order there that's important? Um, if we were having this conversation a few years ago, like back when everything was in chronological order, and um, I think it would matter a lot more then, but now it's all kind of like, you can put it all out at the same time. And regardless of what you do or how you plan it, it's all gonna show up on different platforms for different people at different times, because it's all based on engagement and how many people, um, you know, you could be following 3000 people and I could be following 200 people. So for you, it might take a little bit longer to show up because, you know, out of the 3000 people you're following, um, you know, it's just, it just takes a while to get to. Um, so I think timing wise isn't as much of a concern. Like, I think there's like some common sense and like, you know, not posting it all at the same time at midnight and just kind of thinking about when people are going on. But if you kind of think about it, like, especially on Instagram and Facebook, sometimes we'll see posts that were posted two days ago, but some of us are just seeing it for the first time. And it's all because of the algorithm and the engagement. Um, so I think the timing, um, it's a lot less, you know, of course, with com some common sense in there, it's a lot less important than like the actual content and where it's going, if that makes sense. Okay, so we should not panic and take a few minutes to really craft something that is actually valuable instead of having a mad dash. Yeah, totally. Um, All right, yeah. I'm so taking it, notes. <laughs> it so depends on the platform. It depends on, you know, it's going to be different for individual people as well. Um, you know, who they're following, what, where they're on. Um, if it's a really engaging piece of content, chances are it's going to show up on the feed a lot sooner um, because every time it's engaged with, it kind of gets bumped back up. Um, so again, there's like no magic number, but um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and then just on the sort of like consistency piece of it, you know, it, I think what we're learning is that it's okay to, and it's important to craft sort of slightly different messages on each channel. Um, yeah. What's important in terms of creating a consistent brand image for someone that does maybe follow you on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn? Um, obviously, you want to be catering to each of those different channels, but you might be reaching the same people. So how do you, um, is there any sort of threads through that that are important in order to maintain the consistency? Yeah, I think like, you know, telling the same story each time and conveying the same message each time, that's like your kind of your bottom line piece of consistency. And then what's different is, like you said, different people are on different platforms for different reasons. So like, you know, when, you know, if let's say we're posting this lunch and learn, like the bottom line is, you know, sharing, you know, what this lunch and learn has to offer. But maybe if it's on LinkedIn, it's more focusing on like, you know, the, the, the business aspect of it and how it can help small businesses. Because when folks are on LinkedIn, you know, they're kind of in the mindset of um, being there for business, where if they're on Instagram, they're pro they might be there for both business and personal use. Um, so the language might look a little bit different. Um, so I think that's the part, you know, even though it consistently all tells the same message, the variables are kind of in like the language of how you're conveying it from platform to platform. Okay. Um, and then base, you know, I think one thing a lot of people and businesses struggle with is what, what platforms to be on to begin with, um, yeah. and where to sort of put their energy. I know like, you know, TikTok's the newest one that I think a lot of us had just said, no, I, I can't possibly. Um, there's just too many going on. And I know, you know, we've lost a little confidence in Twitter lately, you know, because we just, you know, don't have, aren't growing our following there. Um, right. so we've been putting most of our energy into Instagram. Um, yeah. and I know it, it, again, depends on the individual business, but, um, 
do you have any advice for maybe someone who's just starting to get their business on social media um, on what channels they should focus on and how to decide how much energy to push and put into each one? Yeah. And this is kind of like, it's always a huge conversation in the beginning, especially when I start with clients is because it is true that there's like this pressure to be on every single um, platform all the time. And I think that, I think just really thinking about like who your company is and the content you have to share and where that works best. Like if you're not really a visual company or you think it's going to be a struggle to create visual content, then um, Instagram probably doesn't make sense for you, which is hard to let go of because everyone knows that Instagram is kind of where most people are spending their time. Um, but then if you're spending your time on Instagram and the stuff that you're sharing on Instagram doesn't really fit the mold, then it's almost more detrimental than it is helpful. Um, and right, you can have a negative impact on your business by poor social media. Yeah. And I've, I mean, I've had this battle since forever and I go back and forth with it, even with my own business. And I've, I've talked to Phoebe about it a lot, just like when we would sit next to each other during the day is like, I have this pressure of feeling like as a social media professional, I should be on every platform leading by example. But the reality is that, you know, Twitter is really hard to grow these days and it's not really profitable. Um, you know, Instagram, I've kind of been branding my own personal one because a lot of the work I do depending on the client, it can be really visual, but a lot of it is just like strategy and data on a computer screen. And it's not really the type of stuff that people are wanting to see on Instagram. Um, so I don't have an Instagram specifically for my business, which seems, hmm. yeah, it's funky. Um, but That's again, cool though. I, I appreciate that. I think that really drives home the importance of finding the channels that work for you. Yeah. And I go back and forth with it all the time. Like, shoot, should I sort of start one? Should I start one now? Um, but it just keeps, you know, I always think back to like, what would I even share? Like, again, I have like three clients that are extremely visual, but I wouldn't want it to only represent those three clients. Um, and so, you know, if you're an individual business owner and you already have a good following on your present, on your, you know, personal one, maybe using it kind of as a way to showcase who you are and what you do, because you're the face of your company. And that's kind of, that's important. Um, I think LinkedIn is important regardless, um, just to be there. And Facebook is kind of like the modern day phone book where even though people are kind of trying to stay away from it, it's, it's important because, you know, Google and Facebook talk to each other a lot more. Like your reviews on Facebook now show up on Google when you Google someone. So it's kind of, you know, even if you're not super active, it's important to just have a presence there. But I think for the other platforms, it's more just, um, thinking about the type of content that you're able to create and what makes sense for you to show up on. Awesome. If you could get rid of one social media platform entirely today with no consequences, what would you get rid of? I, uh, Twitter, maybe. I want to say Facebook because Facebook is like the biggest it's so problematic, but it's also so powerful. So it's one of those. And, and the thing about Facebook is they know it. Like they're never, they're not in a rush to make any changes to help any small businesses out because they know that they've kind of monopolized everything. Um, so I have a love-hate relationship with it because it works so well, but nobody likes time on Facebook. Um, but I guess Twitter because I think people spend a lot of time trying to like maintain what they once had on Twitter, you know, a few years ago. And it's just like not, unless you're a person of interest or a really big company or, you know, there is a big presence of it in, in tech and nonprofit. Um, but a lot of people are kind of spreading themselves thin over there. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, are there any, you know, we're in what, December, 2020. Are there any sort of big social media trends you're seeing that you're excited about? I mean, I think there's a lot of like negative um, energy towards social media, but it can be really amazing too. Is there anything that's getting you really excited right now? Um, I think, I mean, in a way, because of all the negative stuff that's been happening just in society and in the news and just everywhere, you know, it's, it's being talked a lot about on social media, but it's also social media is kind of created this like community or tool in terms of being educational about what's going on. Um, like a lot of, you know, whether it's like sharing infographics on Instagram, which a ton of us are doing right now, like we're all kind of learning a lot from it. So I think if there's a way to kind of separate yourself from the really negative stuff and 
be able to kind of curate who you want to follow and um, and learn a lot from it. I think that like I'd, I've definitely learned a lot from what a lot of my peers have been sharing and this kind of trend of like, you know, infographics or more of like um, a feed not having to be only photographs, but being able to have um, you know, even like the one that you guys did about Indigenous People Day, you know, it was like stuff like that is really trendy right now. And it's also really educational and people really like sharing it. So that's been really exciting. Um, yeah, yeah, there's I think I agree. I've been seeing a lot of really valuable information and and people sort of cel celebrating each other's work um, yeah. and art and writing and thought pieces. And that that's, you know, that always reminds me of why it's important to continue to engage. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to shift to my least favorite topic, um, but one that I believe needs to be addressed, and that's ads. Um, how do you approach it? How much do you spend? I just, I feel like I always, you know, when I was managing social media on my own, I was sort of like, throwing $20 here. This is a good post. I'm going to throw 20 bucks on it. See what happens. Yeah. And yeah. that approach didn't work, um, yeah. believe it or not. So, um, but just love, you know, talk to us as if you were new clients and they ask about ads, like, where do we start? Yeah. Um, bottom line is ads are extremely important and they're becoming more and more important, especially because, you know, Facebook, for example, and, you know, Facebook owns Instagram. So this is kind of grouped into that. Um, they, you know, they're a business too. So they're only helping out, you know, businesses for free for so long. And it's kind of gotten to the point where you can definitely do organic social as much as you want, but um, it's just not, you know, I think organic social is really good for kind of like brand presence and backing up a story and kind of just like, you know, maintaining reputation. Um, but ads is really where it happens in terms of, you know, profiting off of your business online or um, just reaching a much further, you know, demographic one way or another. Um, Facebook also makes it really easy to just say, you know, click this big blue button and give us your money and we'll do the rest for you. And um, a lot of the strategy is comes in where you're kind of like, you know, reading between the lines of what does Facebook suggest you do versus strategically what makes sense. Um, and I think that is definitely the hardest part because Facebook kind of makes it easy for anyone to just run an ad because they say, you know, oh, you want people to buy your product, do this type of ad. And, oh, you want it to be shown to everyone. Let's have it be displayed on every single platform on every, you know, whether it's the right hand column in the between a video um, and in a black and white way, it seems like it makes a whole lot of sense, but it's also a really, it's really easy to spend a lot of money and not get a big return if you're not kind of reading between the lines and um, not doing exactly what Facebook tells you to do, for example. Um, so that's the biggest challenge. And that's kind of where like someone like I would step in and kind of create more of a strategy behind it rather than just um, Facebook walking, you know, anybody through it. Right. And so do you think, um, you know, do you have any resources or ideas if someone did want to kind of kickstart it themselves and, and yeah. get that going, how would they start to do that? Um, I mean, YouTube is awesome. Like there are so many free YouTube videos out there where they literally like walk you through an ad, building an ad, you know, in a very visual way and not just, you know, walking it through the way Facebook will, Facebook would walk you through. They usually be like, you know, Facebook is going to tell you to put it on every single platform, but let's think about it. You know, where are your people? Is it a really big product? If, if it is likely they're going to be buying it from their desktop, not their mobile phone. Um, you know, so I think there's, there's a lot of really great YouTube videos and kind of like free classes and webinars out there um, for people to run, you know, especially if you're just starting out and it's a smaller campaign and you're not spending thousands of dollars, then um, I think it's great to kind of learn. And then if you do do something bigger or you hire someone later to do it, um, it's nice to just kind of have that background education about it, just to kind of understand what ads mean and who they're going to and why. And because um, they're pretty complex. Yeah. 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 That's, that's such a good point. I think I would have defaulted to Facebook, but I think doing that sort of third party research of people who have already been through it is really, yeah. really valuable. Yeah. Um, so businesses that have products, are, are they supposed to be selling on Instagram now? Is that important? I think, I mean, it's almost like Amazon with like the one click shop, like 
you know, again, they want, Instagram wants you to succeed on Instagram because if you're succeeding on Instagram, you might buy ads on Instagram and that's how Instagram makes their money. But that being said, they've added a lot of really cool tools, especially during COVID. I think that Instagram has um, kind of stepped up their game in terms of helping small businesses, knowing that a lot of them are struggling right now. Um, so like, you know, being able to tag your products on Amazon means that someone can buy your product without even leaving the Instagram app um, or really without even leaving like the post that they clicked on, um, which again, love hate relationship with it because as a consumer, it's extremely dangerous and just it's crazy. But from a marketing perspective and for small businesses, it's um, it's really powerful. And I've seen a lot of small businesses do really well on it or, you know, even if they're not you can't really do a lot of links on Instagram. So even if you're, they're not buying it straight through there, the product tag is actually, you know, almost a way to link over to the website where you wouldn't be able to do in a caption. Um, so a lot of these tools that Instagram has been adding have been really great. Great. That's, that's good to know. I've been seeing them pop up more and more and I think it makes sense, but it's, you know, it's hard to know what's, yeah. what's working and what's not. But I think as a small business, why not? Right. Yeah, and they have the new shopping tab now, which it's slowly rolling out to everybody. Um, they don't roll everything out at the same time. So like half of my clients have the shopping tab and half of them don't. Um, but once you have that tab, it's pretty much just like, you know, a feed of products. Um, some from businesses that you may follow, others that are curated towards ones that, you know, you don't follow, but are kind of similar to your trends. Um, and you know, you're not seeing Amazon on there. You're not seeing Best Buy on there. It really is mostly kind of like the smaller, almost like Etsy type versions on Instagram. Yeah, I was scared to click on that. So I'm, I'm glad that I have a little bit more, <laughs> more background now. Yeah. Um, so one question I have, and we talked a little bit about sort of the DIY. Um, when do you think, well, it's sort of a two-part question. Let me start with, um, do you think, social media is something that um, multiple coworkers can share? It can be sort of a shared responsibility of people to sort of chip in? Or do you think someone has to own it? So this goes for maybe small companies that you know, can't really afford to hire a full-time person. Maybe they have a couple staff that are sort of general marketing, um, but you know, want to approach it, approach it in-house. How do you think um, that should work out? Yeah, I definitely, you know, it's a balance. I definitely think it can be like a multiple person or, you know, like a small team um, collaboration. I think that um, the bottom line, you know, it's really easy for it to get to the point where there's kind of like too many cooks in the kitchen. But I think if there's one underlying strategy that everybody that has their hands in on it kind of follows and everyone's communicating and kind of talking to each other, um, then I think that's great. I think when it becomes more detrimental and, um, I've seen the situation a lot, or even I have clients where a lot of the in-house people are still really involved or, you know, it's nonprofits and they have volunteers and the volunteers really graciously want to help, but then everyone's helping with social media and you have 20 people posting in one week and nobody's speaking the same language or, you know, thinking content um, strategy. So I think that's when it starts to get detrimental, but I think it can absolutely be you know, it's great for small teams to kind of work on it together and learn together. And um, as long as there's kind of like this, you know, overarching approach that everybody's taking. And any tips on how to organize your strategy, um, whether it's like a spreadsheet or, a, you know, sort of product management app like Trello or something, do you have any recommendations there? Yeah, there's lots of good ones. You know, Trello is a really great one. Like what, you know, you guys had going on for Visa, like that stuff like that is awesome. Just kind of like creating different, you know, pillars and themes um, and then kind of using it as a collaborative place where everyone can, um, you know, put in their ideas. You know, for some people it's a spreadsheet. Trello is great just because it's more visual and you can, you know, add more links to it. It's just a little bit more in depth. Um, Airtable is another really great one. Um, it's kind of like a mix between a spreadsheet and Trello. It's more spreadsheet like than Trello, but it goes a lot deeper than just a spreadsheet, if that makes sense. Um, so I've seen folks use a lot of, um, do a lot of their content planning on there. And it's all, again, it's all collaborative. So you can have different users and kind of, you know, see who's doing what and just all refer back to it so that even if there are a lot of hands in the mix, you know, people know 
what they're doing and how to make it all cohesive. Awesome. That's definitely helpful. Um, is there sort of an indicator that small businesses should look for when they need to hire someone to outsource it or maybe bring on a full-time social media person? Yeah, I think um, it's really common where, you know, there's like a one or two person marketing team in a business and, you know, whoever's higher up kind of says, you're the marketing person, you deal with all the social media. And then they realize that social media really can be a full-time job itself. Um, and they don't necessarily have the bandwidth to do you know, if you're, if you're the one marketing person, you're doing anything from press releases to, um, you know, hiring someone to film video ads to doing social media. And a lot of those are, that's a lot of jobs in, you know, it's a lot of hats for one person to wear. Um, so I think kind of taking a step back sometimes and saying like, do I have the bandwidth to do it all? And if I am doing it all, is it being executed to the quality that it could be or should be um, and evaluating there? And that's sometimes when it's helpful to bring in help. Um, mm -hmm. even if it's help at a smaller scale where it's just like building a strategy and handing it off so that this person kind of knows what to do and what to post and when and why, um, can be helpful. Yeah. I think, I think that's something that has been helpful for us working with you and, and I'm sure other, other social media folks as well is like, you know, most, most companies allow you to sort of tailor, um, to what your need, level of need is. So if you want just someone to create a social media strategy for you, but then yeah. you want to execute it. That's something that, that all the Milo does. And I think that's, that's really great because I think the reality is that companies are growing and shrinking and growing and growing and shrinking a little bit more, you know, it's not just a one trajectory. So I think having that sort of customizable approach is, is key. Um, especially when, you know, hiring a full-time person is, is really is scary yeah. um, and expensive. Uh -huh. And there's, yeah, there's a lot of potential for, yeah, like you said, things kind of ebb and flow. And I think um, kind of having one person be there, but in, you know, it's just, it's just so not one size fits all. Like social media isn't one size fits all. Companies themselves aren't one size fits all. So having a different approach for different companies, depending on the bandwidth um, can be, is really important. Yeah. Um, and then another one that's, I think has come up a lot this year, particularly, but you know, is always sort of, I think, on, on the mind of, of business owners as when there is a major social or political event or situation in our world, yeah. do companies have to comment on that or make a post on that on their social media channels? I think um, especially, you know, the larger and the more significant the movement, the more pressure there is to do that. But then there's also the fear of being inauthentic um, or saying the wrong thing, or, um, you know, if I'm a, a company that's, um, you know, makes hardware for, you know, engine pieces, you know, it's completely irrelevant potentially to my business, but I still feel passionate about it. So where is the line there and, and what do you usually recommend to your clients? Yeah, um, this has been like, I mean, super relevant this year, obviously, but also a huge challenge, especially because like you said, it's not I mean, it's relevant to every single person, depend, even if they're in a completely irrelevant industry, just um, because it goes a lot more deeper than just, you know, business. Um, but I think social media is just like the tip of the iceberg. So if we're posting on social media, then it obviously needs to be backed up with some sort of action. So I think, you know, what I was suggesting to a lot of my clients, knowing that the conversation of like, you know, hey, we should post something or hey, can you post something for us? Um, you know, usually when that happens, like when little things come up, I have a relationship with my clients where they're like, Hey, can you throw this up? Or like, can we do a last minute post? Um, but with a lot of what happened this year, it was kind of encouraging people to take more of a look at what's going on internally. And if something is going on internally and there's a statement that's being talked about or, you know, change within a company that's happening, you know, then let's talk about that on social media rather than just doing it for more of a performative or, you know, for the sake of it, for, to follow along with the trend. Um, right. And, I think the performative activism part of it is huge. I mean, I, I, the, I think the example that immediately comes to mind is the black squares, right. On Instagram where everyone was like, Oh shit, I have to do this. Everyone else is doing it, but right. didn't realize the whole point of the movement didn't do the research. Right. I think a lot of, a lot of well-meaning people fell victim to that. 
Yeah. Um, so I think like doing the research behind it and really taking your time to make that decision is, is probably the key. Yeah. And I think, you know, like there's this, again, like you said, there's this pressure to post because everybody else is, and maybe as an individual, you're really passionate about it. But when you're doing it on behalf of a company, um, you know, yeah, you need to sit down with the company and kind of say, if we're going to post about this, what are we doing as a company to kind of back that up? And how are we going to follow up about it, you know, in two weeks when not everyone's posting about it, but it still needs to be talked about, or, you know, people are questioning if we even are doing it. Um, so I think it just always, anything on social media, but really, especially when it comes to, you know, social justice, for example, kind of needs to be backed up with action. Yeah, I love that. I think it's such a good reminder of not hiding behind the screen, but really representing the people in the company that you want to represent and, yeah. and not getting lazy around all the automation. Um, right. And, you know, social media makes it easy to be lazy. And I think yeah. um, just reminding ourselves that, you know, you really need to take that extra step is, is important. Yeah, it's huge. And it can happen anytime at any minute and just so yeah, keeping tabs yeah. on that is important. Taking our time, Phoebe. That's what I'm learning here. <laughs> um, well, I we have about 20 minutes left, and I I'm seeing some some red alerts in my chat box. So I want to give everyone else an opportunity um, to ask their questions, and hopefully, I sparked sparked some interest in areas that uh, folks want to cover. So Phoebe, if you want to take over there. Absolutely. Thank you both. Um, so first question is from Phyllis. So Phyllis, if you want to unmute yourself, you certainly can, or I'm happy to read your question as well. I've come so far down in the chat that I have to yeah. go back. You may have even answered about the Instagram um, launch. Like I, I know that you just should not all of a sudden one day appear on Instagram. There's some strategy behind it. If you've already been on social media channels, but just are introducing Instagram and you did answer part of that question because maybe that isn't the right one. To, to do, you know, maybe there are reasons why, you know, we, why you haven't done it before. Maybe there's not enough visual content, but um, do you have any um, thoughts about um, when it is strategically appropriate to introduce, you know, that next channel, Instagram specifically? Yeah, I think, you know, again, um, when you have, it just, it all goes back to content. So when and if you have the content and the story that's ready to be told, I think, um, again, there's no perfect timing. It's all just about what you have to share and um, if what you, what you have to share makes sense on, you know, on that platform. Um, I think just, you know, starting is kind of the hardest part, but if you have the material to share it, then I, I say just go for it. And then you kind of learn as you go. And as your audience grows, you also learn what your audience is interested in and kind of what works and, um, you know, as much as we want to do social media for ourselves and for what we think will perform well, it's also a learning experience about what performs well for, you know, who we're serving. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question is from Heather, who's asking, is there a good rule of thumb for reusing content in terms of how long between posting the same content, assuming it's general, it makes sense to share again? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah. I think, you know, like evergreen content is really important. And when I encourage clients to invest in creating content, whether it's, um, you know, having a photographer come in for a day and just like getting a bunch of pictures done or creating blog posts or, um, you know, webinars or videos or whatever it may be, um, thinking about um, stuff that, you know, I mean, technology is changing really quickly, but there's some things that are always going to be relevant. For example, you know, talking about different platforms or, um, you know, email marketing. So I think that stuff like that can be used at any time, um, especially because it's always part of the conversation and should always kind of be talked about. And um, it might, you know, you might share it a couple months ago and it might be really helpful, but maybe when you share it again in another month or so, it brings up new conversation because um, maybe, you know, people have tried it by then or trends have changed. So there's more questions by then. Um, I think the stuff you have to be careful about reposting is the stuff that's like more specific or more timely to, um, you know, a certain time or event, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think reusing content and being able to like, you know, have a blog post that you pull five quotes from over the next month. Um, there's just so much, once you have a, a little bit of content, you can just start really 
um, using it to your advantage. Yeah, and like you said, using it in different ways. Like, you know, you could post the blog post a couple times, but maybe, you know, like you said, Phoebe's pulling out five quotes from it and turning those quotes into graphics or, um, you know, using those quotes to kind of spark conversation on five individual posts or just kind of, um, yeah, making it last. Mm -hmm. um, next question is from Kelly. Kelly, do you feel like unmuting yourself? Hello, hello, folks. Sorry for the video. My internet's a bit sketchy. Um, question, Sophie. When I was doing social media for iSun um, and was responsible for it, I was using a buffer platform so that I was able to post it various times and set it up automatically. Is that a good process to, to use? Yeah, I think having, you know, there's so many different platforms out there, like um, there's Buffer, there's um, Hootsuite, there's Sprout Social. Um, I think HubSpot even has a really good one. Um, I think those are great because a lot of what can be really time consuming and tedious about social media is, you know, waking up each day and being like, ah, oh, crap, what do I post today? Like, mm -hmm. you know, and not having this whole, you know, whether it's a week or a month planned out. Um, and if you are able to use a tool like that to plan stuff out, then it kind of lets you spend other time on some of like, you know, the less it's more tedious stuff, but it's also really important stuff like the engagement or kind of um, taking a, another look at the strategy or optimizing or, you know, creating content. Um, so any tools that you can kind of have in your toolbox to help you, um, you know, like Buffer is a really good one. Um, I think something though that's important to pay attention to, which Sam and I kind of touched on is because things happen so quickly and mm -hmm when you have these tools, it can be really easy to get lazy about it and just, you know, post and um, forget about it. So, you know, I, I schedule all of my client stuff a month in advance, but I'm constantly checking on it to make sure, you know, like, did anything come up where this would be irrelevant all of a sudden or inappropriate all of a sudden or um, could just because you never know. So great. No, thank you. Appreciate great advice. Um, and Sophie's also the queen of tools and new apps and all the new features. So <laughs> I'm always asking her for her list of recommendations. Um, so we touched on ads a bit, but Julia has a question on boosting messages. Um, so Julia, if you want to unmute yourself. Sure. Yeah, thank you. This has been really, really fun to, to join. Um, I, you, you talked about this a little bit, so you answered it already and you don't need to go into it too much because it can be very specific to businesses, I know, but I am curious. I'm in the early stages of a business and I'm curious about um, budgeting around, you know, what can one expect to pay if I wanted to have a part-time um, someone to manage social media what's the range that someone's paying for doing that? And that's not assuming a boost, obviously, in, in your um, uh, expanding your messages. So first question is, yeah, related to sort of like budgeting for you know, someone to help manage. It's pretty simple what I'm trying to do. Um, and then the second question was, yeah, what's a typical budget start to look like when you're trying to boost into markets like Montreal and Boston and some neighboring areas and you know your target market? You know, yeah. what, what typical budgets are you seeing? Um, in terms of like, you know, hiring help, again, it's like, it's so not one size fits all. And, you know, as much as we all wish we could just have like the perfect package A, B or C to choose from, I think it really comes down to, you know, what the company is doing or what their needs are. And it changes drastically, you know, it changes month to month, like one month, you might have a lot more in the budget to spend. Um, and, you know, maybe in the summer it's quieter. And then, you know, if you're in retail, maybe around the holidays, you're spending a lot more and you're needing a lot more help because of um, Black Friday or just, you know, like you're ramping up sales for whatever reason. Um, so I think, you know, it could be any, it's hard. It could be anywhere from like a small hourly rate of, you know, a couple hours a month, or it could be like a really big monthly retainer for, you know, like a full big marketing plan. Um, so I've dealt with, you know, whether it's been my business or other um, colleagues or like mentors, I've seen, you know, kind of budgets for external help be all over the map. Um, but I think it's important to kind of really hone in on what is important right now because the sky's the limit with marketing. But also if you're new and you're just starting out, then there's ways to really just focus on maybe it's just tapping into a market with, you know, a couple of your products versus the whole shebang. Um, I do think though when running ads, you know, in terms of ad budget, um, 
if you know exactly where, who you're targeting, like you're saying like Montreal and you know exactly who your target market is, um, you can spend less than just, you know, if you were selling a t-shirt that everyone in the entire United States might be interested in, then you're spending a lot more to reach, um, you know, it's just not as specific and there's not as much strategy behind it. Um, but if you know exactly where they are, who they are, what they want, then you can spend your money a little bit more wisely. Awesome. Um, next question is from Max Johnson of Doug Knapp Art, which we love. Uh, Max, do you want to unmute yourself? I can see his question too, if it's easier for me to just answer. I think it's about the best time and day of the week for businesses yeah. to post. Um, yeah, so touched on this a little bit. Again, if we were like, I know we really all miss when everything was in chronological order because we knew when we could just stop scrolling because we had seen everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not like that anymore. And it's really based on engagement. So there's, again, there's not really a magic number. Of course, like common sense comes into it where, you know, if it's a holiday or if it's in the middle of the night or, you know, maybe if it's like a Saturday afternoon and it's a beautiful day and people, you know, you kind of can assume people are going to be outside, then maybe not posting then, but um, just because you post on a really beautiful afternoon on Saturday doesn't mean that's the only time it's going to show up on the feed because, excuse me, with the algorithm these days, it's showing up at all different times for different people kind of within like a one to three day um, time window. So, um, and the cool thing about a lot of these platforms that I was mentioning, mentioning like Buffer and Sprout Social, um, they eventually learn your account's audiences um, and they can start to suggest optimal times based on you know, when your followers are online. Um, Instagram itself has a tool like that too, if you go to the, you know, the back end of the app and you go into insights. Um, so those are little things that can be helpful, but there's really no magic hour or day or time really. Mm -hmm. It's good to know. Um, and then next question is from Michael Dumont. Michael, do you feel like unmuting yourself? I don't actually see him anymore, so I'll read it. Is there an easy program or app to edit a photo and then post from a gallery like Google Photos? Yeah, there's, um, there's a ton. Um, the cool thing now too is like photo or you know apps like um, Google Photos or even like you know iOS photos on our phones these days or you know Visco or Snapseed like whatever it is um, they all have things where you know when you export the photo there's options instead of just like saving it to your phone there's now an option where you can say you know send to Instagram and it kind of skips the option of having to um, save it to your phone and then upload it. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of these scheduling platforms now that we were talking about, they're slowly adding options to be able to edit your picture right in the scheduling platform. So you can kind of like schedule and edit all at once. Um, you know, obviously if you're doing a lot more in-depth editing like Photoshop or, you know, if you're in the Adobe suite at all, or, you know, if it's like video editing, then not so much. But um, most tools these days now have an option to export straight to Facebook or Instagram or, um, you know, whatever tool you're using or whatever platform you're using. That's cool to know. I didn't know that they were, you know, integrating that. Yeah, it's, I don't know much about if it, I think on Android too, but I think a lot of it is, you know, the iPhone and how the iPhone kind of connects all of the apps. Um, I think it's on Android too. I just haven't used an Android in a while, but yeah, yeah. it's pretty streamlined. <laughs> um, Michael Ware, do you feel like unmuting yourself? I see you in our mother's room here at VSET. Yes, just mothering here. Um, thank you for the presentation, Sophia. And I, um, similar to the question that Julia had and the budget stuff that you've been talking about, I, as a developer, I don't necessarily want to do all this myself. I'd like to point them at a resource like you. Um, but I'm often asked the question of like, how do, what's the return on investment? How do you, how can you prove that social media is worth it and is there like spending formulas or anything like that so like how do you convince somebody to take the plunge because that's where I've always run into problems yeah I think um, 
a lot of marketers run into that problem because it's kind of like this known fact where it's like, all right, you need to be here and you need to market for yourself, but like, how do you quantify it? And some things are a lot easier to quantify than others. For example, like if you're running an ad and the ad is strictly to convert to purchases, that's a lot easier to put numbers and data to because you can say, you know, we spent $100 on the ad and it ended up in five, you know, $50 purchases. So there's our return right there. Um, but it gets a lot more abstract when you have a lot of different types of marketing involved and, you know, organic, organic social is a lot harder to quantify in terms of return because, you know, a lot of, it's kind of like PR where organic social is more like reputation management and telling a story and kind of getting your brand out there. It's not directly related to just like, you know, click on this link and buy my product and then we can, you know, convert right then and there. So I think a big talk that I have with clients when starting out is kind of like, what are their expectations? And then kind of educating and managing around that. Um, you know, maybe for them, a return on investment is growing their account a lot. Maybe it is actually selling the product. Maybe it's just like getting launched and getting out there. And so there's like different reports and different data, you know, pieces of data that you can run to kind of showcase, you know, different areas of different goals, if that makes sense. Awesome. And last question is from Jim Sweet. Jim, do you want to unmute yourself? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I was more curious around how to build or, or what your thoughts were about building a, an email list through the website uh, to capture clients that way, um, as okay. opposed to necessarily a specific uh, social media um, platform. Yeah. I mean, email marketing is like it's always going to be there there's talks of like is email marketing dead or you know is it still but e i think email marketing is so important and you know even if you're not doing a, a super frequent newsletter building an email list is really important um because that list of emails can kind of translate to a lot of things it can translate to a social media following later it can translate to you know retargeting folks with ads it can translate to um, getting more website on your traffic or or sending out a newsletter. Um, so I think that if there's ways to collect emails like in an authentic way, then that's really important. And sometimes social media can help be the tool that gets you to where people subscribe to the email list. Um, but I think building an email list is, yeah, it's, it's extremely important and, and always will be. And then and, and what about that, uh, the term squeeze page I've heard recently and I yeah. So looking at it, I, I almost feel not guilty about doing it, but it, it, I guess if, I guess if it's an authentic way of doing it to, you know, sometimes I get annoyed when I go on a website and ask me for my email address. So I'm going to turn around and do the same thing. You right. know? I think, you know, like, like funnels, squeeze pages, like they're all these like, you know, trendy kind of methods for capturing people. And I think, you know, they work, but also like, our radars for just kind of like seeing right through that stuff and like hating it is, you know, it's pretty, none of us like being part of it these days, um, but we also know that it works. So I think if there's a way to kind of build that out in an authentic way, or maybe when they enter their email address, they're able to automatically download something and you're kind of like delivering them something. Um, and that makes it a little bit more, um, you know, it's just, it works two ways. It's more of a two way street. Um, then I think there are definitely ways to, take advantage of these, you know, squeeze pages or lead funnels without seeming too, you know, spammy or inauthentic, which is important. Authenticity is key. Um, this was like the perfect amount of questions for this amount of time. Um, so I think this is a great place to wrap up and just thank you, Sam, for moderating. Thank you, Sophie, for being such a thought leader um, and just generously sharing all of this advice. Um, thanks to the Vermont SBDC for sponsoring this Lunch and Learn. Um, and I'll, I'll put some links in the chat so that you can follow up if you want to connect with her um, outside of this event. Yeah, any questions that I can answer, please let me know. I'm always happy to help. Awesome. Well, thanks, have Sophie. a good day. See you guys Bye. later. Bye. <laughs> Bye.